isn't it? <laughs> hey, you know what? We're just praying that Tuesday it'll be 65. That's what I hear. So we're just going to pretend this isn't happening and move on. So welcome to you who are watching online. Um, get ready for communion today. So we're going to be able to do some online communion with you. So make sure you get some crackers and some juice or something like that. And then when I go ahead and consecrate it, pray, ask God to bless it. We'll do that um, with you as well. And then you can enjoy communion together with us. Because even the internet does not stop God and God's grace, right? So let's stand and let's worship God.
opening prayer. Holy God, Lent calls us to journey with you to the cross. Lent calls us to faithful living, to trust you, Jesus, the one who gives us life. Lent calls us to, to take up our cross and to follow you. Let us worship God who walks with us this and every day. So someone, okay, kids, come on up. But someone asked me, hey, why is there dead stuff on the altar? <laughs> well, this is Lent, right? And Lent is all about introspection. Hi there, girl. Um, and looking at our sin and really weighing out our sin and asking God to forgive us and really repenting of it, really understanding that our sin causes some problems, right? <laughs> Um, to other people, to ourselves, and get us in a bind, right? And so when Easter comes and resurrection morning, this will be beautiful, right? But until then, we'll walk into the cross. So that's why it's kind of solemn colors. That's why it's kind of like, you know, wintertime, you know, kind of that time to just sit back and take a look at our lives and see how we're doing with our relationship with God. So how are you guys today? Everybody good? Yeah? yeah? Okay. So I have... Um, a choice you have to make today, okay? I have two roads on the ground, okay? One is a wide gate path, wide road, and one is a narrow, skinny, right? Skinnier road, okay? Um, if you do what it says on each one of these, you will get the same thing, okay? You will get the same thing, but you have to decide which road you're gonna go on. Do you want to do the quick one? Easy. You have to clap twice and yawn. That's not too hard. And then, see, you already got that down pat. Or do you want to do the long one? Which one would you do if you got the same thing? You're going to get the same exact thing as if you were to do the long one. Why do you want to do the long one? You don't know? I'm going to do the short one. So go ahead, pick your sides you want, get behind each other. Sam seems to work. Ready? Okay. Get behind each other. Okay. Next, first, clap two times. Walk on it, clap. And then walk again. Yawn. Hurry up, gotta go. Yawn. Oh, I get my prize already. Okay, you guys keep going. Ooh, shiny. Okay, all right. Give a high five to anybody. Okay, and then what do you say? Jesus, I love you. Okay, get up. All right. High five. All right, say, Jesus, I love you. Okay, that's close enough. <laughs> okay, come up here. Right here. <laughs> Jump three times. High five. All right. Jesus, I love you. All right. To do that one much longer, right? But why did you pick that? Why did you pick this? Why did you pick the longer one? You wanted to do something tougher. Yeah. Okay. Well, do you think most people, if they knew they were getting the same thing, would pick the easy way? Most people pick the easy way. Let me give you another example. Let's say your teacher says, "I'm going to give you a spelling test," and the teacher says, "You have a choice to make. You can either take the words that I gave you to study." and use that sheet when you take the spelling test, or you can do it without the words. Now, you haven't studied very well. So, which one, she's giving you a choice. Which one are you gonna take? You haven't studied very well for it. You're gonna take the sheet, right? I mean, how many would you take the sheet? We're gonna take what's a little easier, right? Okay. Just so you know, this would have been, because I said you're gonna get the same thing, didn't I? And the same thing is you were gonna get a prize at the end of each path that you chose to go down. So you guys did really well because you chose the more difficult path, didn't you? This is what you would have got if you went the easy way. Something shiny and wonderful. Look inside there. Pull one out. <laughs> you would have got a pot cone. Woohoo! <laughs> but instead, this is what you're going to get. Yeah. I know, you have to wait. Okay. <laughs> Let me read you what Jesus says. Okay, this is interesting. So pretend those are roads. One is skinny, narrow, and it took a while for you to do it because you each had a weight line. It took a long time, right? 
and that is a wider road, and it was quick, fast, and easy. And you guys were going to get the same thing. You were going to get a prize, but I kind of tricked you, didn't I? It's tricky people out there. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, enter through the narrow gate. Which one of those is the narrow gate? Which one of those is the skinniest? That one. Yep, he says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. That's a broad road, okay? And many enter through it. If they didn't know what was in the bags, and I said you were getting the same thing, most people would have chosen the wide road, wouldn't they? Because it's easier. It's a shortcut. I'll do it. It's easy. But Jesus says, I want you to enter into my heart through the narrow way. I want you to serve me. I want you to come to Sunday school. I want you to pray. I want you to learn all you can about me. And when you do, when you do, you can just spend time and eternity with me in heaven. But so many people take that way, the wide way. And I'm going to sleep in. I don't need to go to church. I didn't roll my clock forward, right? So I'll miss it. It'll be fine. But you know what? God might have something special for somebody today. He had something special for you guys today, didn't he? Because you guys are getting some treats, aren't you? Yeah, so um, Donna, where are you? Okay, Donna's going to take you guys downstairs, and I need your help. She's got a little craft for you to do, and we're going to use it to decorate for Easter, for our Easter breakfast. Exciting! I know. Yeah, we're going to have Easter breakfast. I know. It's going to be great. So, here you go. Take your little, take one of your prizes. All right, actually, you can take the whole bag. Wait, wait, wait. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for reminding us that the narrow way, the path to know you intimately as our loving God, is difficult. It's hard. And many people won't choose that way. They'll choose the easy way. But we thank you, Lord, that you have commanded us to go through the narrow gate to learn about you, to pray, to come to church, and to do those things will draw us closer to you. You do it for our own good. And so we thank you for that lesson. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, bye. <clears throat> yep, the little ones and all you guys are going down. Miss Donna's going to take you down. You get your candy. You know, leave it to these good kids to pick the narrow way. <laughs>
But listen to this article from State Farm. This is the title of the article. Pedestrian safety for texting while walking. Here's what it says. Pedestrian traffic deaths are at the highest since 2009. Cell phones, right? And distracted walking is likely partially to blame. In just 10 years, there have been over 51,000 pedestrian deaths, an increase of 53%. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. I mean, if I'm texting and walking and I'm looking down and I'm going to cross the zebra stripe, right? I'm going to go ahead and cross and I'm like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I'd love to go shoe shopping with you. That would be great. And it's, I glance up and I see that it's the little guy that says you can walk, right? So I'm walking, but this guy decides he's going to turn right on a red and he's going to hit me. I don't even know him because I'm, I don't even notice him because my head's down and I'm going shoe shopping. In fact, oh, I could go on, I could go on to Amazon right now and I could look at a pair of shoes, right? And then all of a sudden I'm just boom, running into stuff. So this could happen. The problem is becoming so bad that in the United States, some cities have passed a law or a ban against texting and walking. <laughs> Honolulu was the very first city to do that. $35 fine if you are caught texting, looking at your phone with your head down and crossing an intersection. $35. Mm -hmm. Now some cities and other countries have kind of taken a, I guess you would say a proactive approach. So what they're doing is when you have the crosswalk, you know, it's got the zebra stripes or it's got the white lines, you know it's a crosswalk, right? And you see the light and the little guy says, go ahead and walk. What they're doing in some cities is installing lights on the ground in those crosswalks. Green for go and red for stop because when my head's down, if I, if I can see what's on the ground, so I see that it's green, I can see that it's red, oh, I better stop. Can you believe this is happening? <laughs> can you believe it? They're doing this because people are literally dying from texting and walking. I never thought that. I never thought there would be somebody stupid enough to die yeah. while texting him, amen? So here we are, it's the Jerry Festival and the fudgies are up, right? Any fudgies in here, I love you. But if, the, if you're not a fudgy, okay? And here they are. Oh yeah, we could go here and they're walking right at you. And what do you do, okay? If you're a pastor, you should do something nicer than what I do, but this is what they do. They're walking right at me and I'm looking at them and I'm like, no clue. They walk, and then boom, they run into me. And what's the first thing I say is, pay attention, right? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe there's some nice people like you. Here comes, here comes the teenager with their, oh my God, at least not gonna fight me to the dance. I know, it's so rude. And you see them coming and you're just like, oh, and you get out of the way and you look at them. And they have no clue, they just walk right by, right? But I never literally thought that somebody could fall into a manhole while texting and walking, and yet you go on YouTube and this actually happens. Seriously. But most of the pedestrian accidents and deaths are from cars because people are driving like maniacs, are they not? Mm -hmm. yeah. I just never thought texting and walking, distracted walking, could literally kill you. I just never thought that. And I think the scripture reading that Jill read for us this morning, I never really thought or paid attention much that a false teacher could actually kill someone. I never thought that because I thought I will be able to recognize a false teacher. I'm the pastor. I know everything in the Bible. I will be able to recognize him. Nobody's going to come in here. My people are going to know him. They're going to put their hands up. They're going to say, uh-uh. Jesus says, beware Pay attention to a potential killer. He says, watch out for false prophets. Hmm. Yeah. This is a matter of life and death. When Jesus says beware, when Jesus says pay attention, when Jesus says warning, warning, we need to pay attention. This is a sermon on the mount. He's saying warning, warning. Why is it a matter of life and death? <coughs> Listen to the scripture right before this one. This is what Jesus says. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. 
But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Jesus tells us then that false teachers could kill us because they're going to lead us down the easy way, the wide gate. The wide gate is always available to us. The easy way is always available to us. Go somewhere where everybody agrees because that'll be easier, right? Go somewhere where everybody looks the same and votes the same and thinks the same because that'll be a heck of a lot easier, right? Because if you sit in a pew somewhere or you sit in a group somewhere and someone doesn't agree with you, well, I, I, I don't like that. I want everybody to agree with me. How are we going to learn? How are we going to struggle with scripture? How are we going to struggle with situations if we don't spend time with people that are different than us? That is a false teacher. And they do it every time because it's easier to go the wide road, isn't it? So, I, have, I just started preaching. I was supposed to be doing the series recap. So let me get to that. So anyway, we're on the Sermon on the Mount, okay? And... Um, we're at the last chapter of the Sermon on the Mount, by the way. So the Sermon on the Mount starts in Matthew chapter 5. It is Jesus' most famous teaching on what it means to live a life that brings the kingdom of heaven to earth. When we, when we follow Jesus, when we love him and we try and we show up and we try to be a peacemaker, even with that person that irritates the heck out of us, we try to be a peacemaker. Something good comes out of it. Jesus does something. You get a glimpse of how we're supposed to live together. That's what we've been studying from chapter 5, 6, up until now. But now, Jesus switches gears. It goes from how to live as a citizen in the kingdom of heaven on earth, so people can get a glimpse of what it's supposed to be like, how we're supposed to get along, to now this is how you enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so we're switching gears. So now instead of looking at it through the lens of how we can bring the kingdom of heaven to earth, it's now how do we enter the kingdom of heaven? How do we enter that experience right here on earth? How do we do that? And Jesus tells us, you enter the narrow way. You enter the narrow way. But I always thought the scripture was talking about believers and unbelievers. Isn't that what you've heard that preached on? Enter the narrow way. If you enter the narrow way, Instead of the wide way, the narrow way leads to Jesus Christ. He's the only way to heaven, and yes, that is true. Or you could go the narrow way or the wide way, which is easy, and that leads to destruction, which is hell. Okay? Believers, unbelievers. And we think, hey, I'm on the narrow way. I love Jesus. Everything's good to go. Simple enough. But then why does Jesus say many will enter through the wide gate. And you say, because the world's going to heck in a handbasket, right? Everybody's doing what they want. Just like I didn't know that somebody could literally die from texting and walking, you got great grandchildren. Guess what they're going to be doing? Texting and walking. This is what they're going to be doing. And you would say, put your phone down, kid. We are two generations from people growing up with the scriptures. Two generations. That means your great-grandbabies ain't going to go to church. They might, but they might not. And guess who's going to lead them down the false way, the wide road, the easy way? The false prophets are going to. Yep. The false teachers are going to. That should upset you, shouldn't it? Shouldn't that upset you? It should have sent me. Just like texting and walking, I didn't think it was a big deal. But apparently it is. 51,000 pedestrian deaths. Now, not all of them are texting and walking, but some of them are. And they could be prevented. Two generations of little ones not knowing the stories of Jesus. No grandma here to take them anymore. This, so they have no roots. And when you have no roots, you don't know what's right, you don't know what's wrong, and somebody can come and lead you astray. They can say, this is the better way to go. You don't believe me, Jim Jones. Look at the cults. He led thousands of people astray. And I could go on and on. 
And that's when people were going to church. That's when the generations were raising their children to hear the stories, to know how to fight against those false teachers. Jesus is saying, warning, warning, pay attention. Pay attention. Are we? So, here we go. How do you recognize a false teacher? I think that's important, right? Number one, the first way we recognize false teachers is to pay attention. They're coming for you. That's what Jesus says. Watch out for false teachers. So pay attention. This is real. They come to you. Who's you? The church. The church. Okay? They come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly, they are ferocious wolves. They will come to the flock, to the believers, into the church. These false teachers seem harmless because they look like everybody else. They say the right thing. They might even tell a lie testimony about how Jesus changed their life. I can give you an example. When Char was here, there was a guy that came into the church and um, seemed like a nice guy. And he, you know, he was here for like a hot minute. And he told Char, I want to preach next Sunday, Pastor Char. And she goes, <laughs> He was saying all the right things. He believed in Jesus. He loved Jesus. And he says, I'm being called to preach. And she's like, well, we have lay servant ministry for that. You can go through there and figure that out. You've got to go through the steps. You've got to go the narrow way. I don't want to. There's a pulpit. Get up here and let me preach. She went on. So then he says, I'll lead a Bible study. Who is this guy? Some of you remember him. You remember him. Good looking guy. Um, very well spoken, seemed to have it all together, found out he was beating his wife. Mm -hmm. Get up to the pulpit. <laughs> right? So there was a lot of things that were wrong, and there were some red flags. And that pastor could have said, okay, you know what, I'm going to be gone next week, come on in. Mm -mm. This, this is... <laughs> This is a scary place, the pulpit. If your knees aren't shaking, if your stomach isn't going, oh my gosh, I got to get up here and try to preach like Jesus the Christ, you better be afraid. Because what you preach better be true. Right? And what he was going to preach was not going to be. So they come looking good. They come as sheep dressed in or, and they come as wolves dressed in sheep clothing, so they look like everybody else. Here's what Paul says in Acts 20. He confirms this. He says, keep watch over yourselves, he's talking to the leaders of the church, and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. So leaders, keep watch over yourself. Because guess who Jesus, or guess who Satan wants to attack? Is the leaders of the church. Because if the leaders say, eh, I'm done. I give up. Do you know how many pastors quit? Do you know how many times I've said I give up? I, literally, a lot. <laughs> and yet, here I am. Right? So he says, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Paul says, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on guard. The Apostle Paul confirms this. He reminds the leaders of the church, pay attention, watch for wolves that come and devour the flock. I'm going to stop right there. What would a wolf... Now think animals... What would a wolf try to take from a sheep? Blood. That's right. Is he going to take money? Nah. Is he going to take reputation? The sheep could care less. The sheep wants to go eat. The only thing the wolf wants, the only agenda the wolf has is to destroy the sheep. That's it. Seek, kill destroy. Who does that? Evil. So there's evil out there. 
And as believers in Jesus, the wide road is always available to us. We might say, I'm a believer in Jesus. The Holy Spirit will protect me. That's right. The Holy Spirit will protect you. But you can go, la, 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 la. I'm going to go out here. I'm going to go out to the bar anyway, even though I have given up drinking for the last 20 years. But I'm going to go anyway because I can handle it. And there's my friends, and they lead me right to that same vice I have to deal with. There's the wide road. It's always there. It's always an option, right? Wolves are out to destroy. That's what they do. And they're going to infiltrate the church. And then Jesus says, but even the gates of hell will not destroy my church. Do you know why? Some may go the wide way. Some may denounce the Holy Spirit, give up their faith in Christ some won't. And that remnant will be walking the narrow way. And it's going to be hard. And it's going to be a cross you carry for Jesus. Not a gold crown. You get those later. <laughs> you get a cross now. It's hard work. Beware, he says. So the second way we recognize false teachers is by their fruit. Jesus says it right here in verse 16. By their fruit, you will recognize them, the false teachers. Now, false teachers can be preachers. False teachers can be people that are believers in Jesus. False teachers can be prophets, because he says false prophets. Um, back in, back in Jesus' day, who did he call the false teachers? The religious people. That's who he called the false teachers. Remember he said to the disciples, don't do what they do. They say one thing and they do another. They're blind guides. Remember he said that? So they can, be, they can be people in the church. They can be influential people. So you recognize them by the fruit. So what does the fruit represent here? The fruit can mean, can be something the false leader or disciple or follower of Jesus or um, the false prophet can say. It can also be something that they do. It can also be something that they don't say. If you walk into a church and you never hear about repentance of sin, you might want to run the other way. And you say, well, I don't want to hear about only repentance of sin. I don't want to always look at my sin. Yeah. If we don't always look at our sin, then why do we come here and worship a, a God who died on the cross for it? Right? So if you never hear sin, you never hear about repentance... All you hear about is love, 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 which is good. God is love. That's why he sent his son to save us from our sins. That's part of the gospel. But people don't like that when you say that, Pastor. It's the truth. It's the gospel. It all goes together. So the fruit of the false prophet can be something they don't say. It can also be something that, um, that they do. You know, we've seen a number of very influential pastors that were believers, that were living a horrible life. Rabbi Zacharias was one. He was an amazing preacher. He's passed away. But he had a problem with, um, I think I've told the story, Rabbi Zachariah, you know him, Jeff. You've watched some of his stuff. He's passed away, but he um, became such a big preacher, and they were... They were following him more than they were God because nobody could tell him that he was doing something wrong. If I'm doing something wrong, tell me. I may have made a mistake. I do that. <laughs> Sometimes I misspeak. It wasn't intentional. You'll know if it's intentional because I'll keep doing it. Right? You'll know if I'm a false prophet. You should. So Rabbi Zachariah was in a car accident, so he decided that he was going to go get a massage. Because that helped him. Good reason. Makes sense. Well, he decided that it was such a good thing that he bought up all the massage parlors. And he spent most of his time there. And I can tell you what, it wasn't just a massage. His leadership knew it. Some of them did. Because they finally brought it to his attention. Ten years later. I'm just saying, is he evil? No. He's not. He was dealing with a sin and a struggle with sin, but no, everybody was afraid to tell him that. And so he wasn't preaching the truth because what he was doing didn't match what he was saying. 
And yes, we're going to make mistakes. We're not going to be perfect. But when someone holds us accountable, I would hope we'd say, geez, I didn't know I was doing that. Let me, read, let me try to do something different because that's not right. Right? So you will know them by their fruit. What they say won't match what they do. And they will not line up with scripture. They will not line up with the gospel. They will not line up with the gospel. And you know the gospel story. Let's repeat it. Jesus, or God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, right? That whoever believes in him shall not perish on the road to destruction but will have eternal life. That's what the gospel is. Jesus rose again to defeat sin. That's what he did. If you don't hear that at a church, if you don't hear that we only worship a one true God, three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, triune God, one God, if you don't hear that, run. You're in a church with a false teacher. Now, let's look at some of these things that these false teachers, what their fruit do. So um, if you look at Jeremiah 23, 16, this is God speaking through Jeremiah the prophet. He says, this is the Lord Almighty. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you, because they had false prophets back then, false teachers. They will fill you with false hope. They will speak visions from their own minds, not from the word of God. So they will speak a false hope. Do you know what is a false hope? Saying that when you believe in God and you come to church and you give your money, you will be successful. You will make five times the amount of money. Have we heard that prosperity preaching? Yeah. There's a number of preachers that do that. Well, you must not have been given enough if you're not getting more. No, no. Or you must, have, you must have sinned because there's some sin you're dealing with. That's why you're not getting healed. You heard that? I literally went to a Pentecostal church where they said, well, if you're not, gonna get, if you're not getting healed, it must be because you have some sin. In that is bad theology. Amen? That's not what Jesus said when they said, who sinned? Why this guy's blind? Who sinned? His mom or dad? And Jesus said, neither of them did. He can't see so I can show you that God is bigger than illness. God is bigger than disease. God is bigger than death. Because our loved ones go, don't they? We love them and they go, but we know that we will see them again. They'll give you a false hope. Everything's going to be great when you follow Jesus. And what did Jesus say? <laughs> When you start following me, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have problems. You're going to have to pick up your cross. You're going to have to go the narrow road. Because when people see you living for me, when they see you struggling with an issue, with an illness, with a sin, and all you can do is rely on Jesus, they're going to go, that's the God I want to follow. That's who I want to follow. So last, the last way we recognize false teachers is to test the fruit. So we must test the fruit, okay? And so Jesus is interesting. He does this parable. He says, do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit and every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. When I go up to the winery... Right? And I see the grapes, or I see the grapevines. If I lift up a leaf, I expect to find a peach. <laughs> no, I expect to find a grape. When I go out to the orchard and I go to the trees, the apple trees, do I expect to find an orange? No, I expect to find an apple. It all has to do with the nature of that tree. A false teacher will have their roots planted in the one and only true God, Jesus Christ. The rest will not. And therefore, if they're a bad tree, they're not going to ever be able to produce good fruit. 
So if you wait long enough for those false prophets, you will eventually see that their fruit rots. You'll find out that they were working for the money so they could go up to a bigger church. If you get into the ministry because of the money, good Lord, what's wrong with, what's wrong with people? <laughs> right? If you wanted the prestige and the power, God will set you straight. Unless you're a false prophet. Then he'll continue, then Satan will continue to give you what you want. Prestige, power, reputation. And things will look great. And there will be no struggle. How, how can we follow a God who struggled all the way to the cross to get to resurrection day and not expect to struggle with our own faith? Struggling with your faith is a good thing, folks. It builds faith muscles. It gets you ready to pay attention to the false teachings that are coming our way. Remember, Satan's running out of time. He's running out of time. We're getting closer and closer to the return of Christ. We don't know when. I'm not telling you when because I don't know. But you can tell. You can tell what's happening in the world. It's following scripture. And so we're running out of time. He's running out of time. So he's going to come on even worse. So, the fruit. James tells us. What kind of fruit you will eventually see, the rotten fruit that you will eventually see from the false teacher. Eventually. It'll look good to begin with. It'll look great. Say the right thing, do the right thing. But then all of a sudden the fruit will start rotting. It's when you buy a bag of oranges. You know, we had a bag of oranges when we were in Florida. My mom went and got some oranges in Florida from California. <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> whatever. They were good, but they weren't Florida oranges. And so we're like, oh my gosh, they're beautiful. Well, the next day we went in there, a couple days later, and we're like, what smells? And we look, pull out the fruit, and down at the bottom is a rotten orange. Eventually, you will know the false teacher's rotten fruit if you test it. This is how James tells us. If you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you find envy, which is jealousy, right? Self-ambition, all about me, my agenda, what I want, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. Notice that James does not say anything about theological viewpoints. He doesn't say a false teacher is one who has a different theological viewpoint than someone else. He doesn't say that, does he? He says it's someone who's jealous, someone whose self-ambition is all about them and their agenda and what they want. Right? I was surprised. I thought it'd be something about leading people astray from the gospel, which is true. But people can call people false teachers just because they don't agree with them. People can call people false teachers because they struggle with the sin. We all struggle with sin, folks. Yeah, but that sin's worse than my sin. Right? They must be a false teacher. They must not be a believer at all. That's not what he says. He says it's those who are jealous and those who are all about themselves. Because you can't be all about yourself when you follow Jesus. James says that we will harbor in our hearts. What we harbor in our hearts will eventually come out in what we say and what we do and how we act. And if that's what's in our hearts, envy, self-ambition, it's all about me, I want it my way, it's eventually going to be rotten fruit that you can smell down the road. Right? So this begs the question, what kind of fruit does a true teacher of God produce then? Well, godly teachers teach about making disciples. Because that's what Jesus commanded. Go and make disciples, right? Teach people about Jesus and the gospel. Tell your story, your true story, right? And live your life according, as best as you can, 
We're not gonna be perfect, but we're gonna live the best we can. Use your gifts to benefit others. My gift is preaching. If all I did was preach and wanna to make tons of money and go talk around the world, if that was where God called me, that's where I'd be. That's not where he calls me. He calls me to the small rural church. That's what he does. And that's, that's okay. That's what I'm doing. Use your gift to benefit others. Lead lost people to Jesus. Don't lead them to a place where you think it's going to be great. You know, Jesus is great, but we like to lead people to places that are not Jesus. We like to lead them to praise bands. We like to lead them to smoke and mirrors. We like to lead them to, we have Mountain Dew and Pepsi instead of coffee. You know? Isn't that great? Now, I'm all for pop, and if the kids want it, I say we get it. But anyway, I want to make them happy. But really, we lead people and we point people to Jesus. That's what we do. We want to point people to something different. It's like we're almost begging people, begging people to come to church because, um, oh, so-and-so is going to do a really special song, so come. Well, that'd be great. Come for that reason. But come because you're going to experience the Christ. Come because you need to hear the word of God. Because he's got something to say to you, and he's got something to say to me. That's what godly teachers do. They also love their fellow believers that they disagree with. That's what it says right there in 1 John 3, 14. They seek humble ways to do good wherever they go. As a true teacher of the word of God, it is my job to point you to the Christ is to point you to Jesus who can change your life. It is my job not to say you're wrong, I'm right, but to listen, to struggle, to work through it. My job as a true leader of Jesus is to be a conduit and point to him who's the only one that can change anybody else's life. We can't do it, but Jesus can. So let's remember that each one of us are a teacher. Each one of us are a leader. Each one of us have the opportunity to tell the falsehood, to go the easy way, or to go the narrow way. Let's remember that we're on a narrow path. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. But what awaits is the glory of the Christ. That's why we do it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. And we thank you that... You know, there's false teachers that are going to come in and they're going to sound good. And if we don't think that we can be led astray, your word clearly tells us, Jesus says, beware. These people are going to come and they're going to look just like you. And they're going to sound good. And pretty soon, Lord, you tell us, watch their fruit. Watch it rot. So, Lord, protect this church. Protect this church from those who would try to come and preach falsehoods. Protect this community as they struggle with knowing you, and it's okay to struggle. Be with the people here as they go out into the world and try to answer questions, not to be right, but to point to you. That's our job, and it's hard. So give us the strength to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to do um, Holy Communion now. So I'll have Jill come up and Ginny, you want to come up? Okay. And again, in the Methodist Church, we have open communion, which means it's an open table, which means you do not need to be a member of the Methodist Church. You do not need to be a member of any specific church. You need to come. It's an open table. And experience the Christ the way he wants you to experience him. So let's look for our hand sanitizer. We are very cleanly here. <laughs> so on the night that Jesus was to give up his life for you and for me, he took bread and he lifted it up to heaven and he gave thanks to God for it. And he said to his disciples, after he broke it, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Eat this and remember what I've done for you. <clears throat> you got your crackers, get your crackers ready. 
and your juice, milk, whatever. And then after the supper, he took the cup and lifting it up to heaven, he gave thanks to God for it. And then he said to his disciples, take, drink. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. This is why I've come. This is the mission. So drink this, all of you, and remember what I've done for you. All right, so if you have your stuff there online, put your hands over it and let's all pray. Lord, we thank you that you love us no matter what. Sometimes we want to go on the wide path. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes we just want to go, I'm tired. I want to be comfortable. But we know, Lord, it's not about us. It's about you. And the narrow path will lead us to a glimpse of you. And that's what we want. And we want to show others that way. And so we thank you, Lord, that when the tough get going, you have a blessing waiting for us. And that is your very presence with us. So, Lord, we thank you for this bread and this juice, and we ask that it be the very body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. too if you'd like them.
so we can just lift a hand with the name and a category, health, um, surgery, cancer. So go ahead and lift up a hand and what would we like to pray about? If Julie's writing down, it goes on our prayer chain. Jim. Joyce for health. Joyce for health. Thank you. John. Michelle for health. Michelle for health. Pray for cancer and all the people in here that could have it. Okay. Pray for a cure for cancer. Kelly. Yeah. My, my dad's in hospital. Stan's in the hospital, so for Pastor Stan for healing. Steve. Heather for uh, spiritual healing. Heather for spiritual healing. We want to pray for the family of Marty Flater. Her beloved family is back there, so make sure you give them a hug. They're going to need that. Her funeral will be this Saturday, and um, Jenna will be heading up the food. And we want to make sure it's done right. You know, it's for Marty. <laughs> and so um, be in prayer for the family. Yes. Dalton for personal. Dalton for personal. Personal. Okay. Cindy? Eric's got to have a procedure in Grand Rapids on Wednesday. Okay. So for good results for a procedure on yeah. Wednesday. And then he's having an MRI on Friday. So good oh. results for that. Got to go in that tube? Yeah. Are you claustrophobic? No. I am. <laughs> okay. So we'll pray for you as I'm worried about you. <laughs> Donna? Up to my sister Marcia and her husband Ray traveling. Okay. And then uh, Ray's having cataract surgery when he comes back. Ray's having cataract surgery when he comes back and they're traveling. So we want to pray for Marcia and Ray. Um, uh, a friend of my um, girl, girlfriend, uh, Dave Sheck, uh, needs surgery on his uh, ankles and knees, but. Um, he developed an infection, so prayers that he will get over the infection so he can have surgery next week instead. Okay, so for Dave check to heal from the infection so he can have his surgery. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and prayers for Terry. For Terry, for personal oh. health. Health. <laughs> Jack? And just again for cancer, I have a dear friend whose mom is dealing with cancer. So it's grace. For it's friends, grace. family, all those that struggle with cancer. I have a um, card here from Sharon Kaiser, who also has cancer, and we've been praying and praying and praying for her, and she writes this to the church. Every time, dear church friends, every time I lay on that card table and ride into the MRI machine, I feel your prayers. The staff wants to know if I've taken Ativan, must be a calming drug, because I'm so calm. It's the drug of prayer that keeps me calm. So your prayers are priceless. I miss Joy Hour and the fellowship we share. Hopefully I will be able to attend a church service soon. Thank you for praying for me. God bless you all. Love, Sharon Kaiser. So she can feel the prayers. So keep those prayers coming. Sue? For our kids and our grandkids and just everything they go through at school. Yeah, school's a pretty tough place. Yep. We want to keep our youth and um, for Places like the Rock that will help them be able to get some of that stuff off their chest. Ellie. For the family of Nancy Knight. Church guidance and direction. Grandma Sally for help. Grandma Sally Prayers for help. For Dennis Richardson's family, he just passed away previously. So for the family of Dennis Richardson. Thank you. Other prayers? All right. Let's pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for being with us. We thank you that you are here present through the power of your spirit. And for that, we just thank you so much. There are so many that we are praying for to be healed from cancer. Lord, there's some that are going for MRIs. There are some that are going for cancer um, treatment. We just cover them in your mercy and your grace. We pray for continued research for a cure for cancer. We do pray for our first responders and our military as they're out there protecting us so that we can come here and pray without fear of being interrupted, of being shot at, or any of that. We thank you, Lord. For those first responders and we pray for them as they see things that none of us will ever see so we pray for them we continue to pray for our church for guidance direction 
and for you, Lord, for you to be the one to lead and direct and for us to hear from you. And we thank you for teaching us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
So what do we have to announce? We have some announcements? Jeff. All right, well, I'm supposed to be Stacy. Hey, come up here, Stacy. Come on, Stacy. All right, so at council meeting, Tuesday night, 7 o'clock p.m. So you want to know what's going on with the church? That's a good time to come down. And you're welcome to come as, uh, as part of the congregation. Come on down and see what we're talking about. Bills and all the good stuff. And, of course, a discussion about our church. Um, also, Easter breakfast. I've got lots of folks signed up now. Uh, but let's invite somebody. Let's fill that place. And the... Offering that we're going to take down there, I think we'll do the roof. We need to do this roof, so we'll take an offering then for the roof. Great. Yeah. Thank you. That's it. All right. Anything else? Just we need to continue to have eggs. Bill. We had a lot of candy now. Now we need eggs. So need please eggs. Um, continue to pick them up, stuff them, bring them back. We would appreciate it. We've got that big Easter egg hunt coming March 23rd. It is becoming a community Easter egg hunt. So we get, I don't know, how many, 300 people? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of kids that need candy. And so we need help. There's a sign-up sheet. Go ahead. Take a look. Let's pray again. Lord, thank you again for all you do for us. Give us the strength to go out and shine bright for you. In the name of Christ, amen. amen. All right. If you do communion, make sure you catch your little communion cups. Take them off. Look at what you did to my hat. <laughs>